My name is Nick, and I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is at least 20 people with an AR-15 and a couple trace rounds. I think I can do it get done. Location is Stone Douglas in Parkland, Florida. It's going to be a big event. And when you see me on the news, you'll all know who I am. <laughs> You're all going to die. Pew, 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 pew. Oh, oh, shit! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! A high school in Parkland, Florida, became the scene of chaos and panic just before the end of the school day. The Broward County Sheriff says at least 17 people are dead. 17 people. After police say that a shooter believed to be just 19 years old opened fire at his former high school. Over and over again this year, we have seen, heard, and reported on sad and harrowing scenes like this one. We begin with the terrifying moments inside a high school in Kentucky, a student opening fire on classmates just as they were arriving for class. There has been another school shooting in America, this one in Santa Fe, Texas, outside of Houston. ABC News has confirmed that according to local law enforcement officials, there are multiple fatalities. Shots were fired inside a Maryland high school today and the school was put on lockdown. Shortly before the opening bell, the call went out for shots fired at Great Mills High School. Have one CPR in progress. One with a gunshot wound to the head. One with a gunshot wound to the leg. We begin with that deadly rampage in California. A lone gunman, a powerful arsenal, seeming to pick his targets at random, including that elementary school shooting into that class full of kindergartners. The gunman had already killed four people by the time he started firing into the Rancho Tehama Elementary School right during morning drop-off. For the last two years, ISIS has urged its followers to attack innocent civilians using vehicles. The driver turned with purpose and mowed through a popular bike path used by millions. Pedestrian hit at Pier 40. Hitting more pedestrians and cyclists, slamming into cars and crumbling bikes, coming to a stop just blocks from the national September 11th memorial. Authorities calling it an act of terror. The NYPD already on high alert for truck attacks. We have been tested before as a city very near the site of today's tragedy and New Yorkers do not give in in the face of these kinds of actions. The deadliest terror attack in this city since 9-11. We're following this breaking news out of Sutherland Springs, Texas, a shooting taking place at the First Baptist Church there. Uh, multiple uh, people have been shot. Sutherland Springs joining Las Vegas, Orlando, Newtown, a list of names synonymous with mass shootings in what seems like an endless and accelerating stream of gun violence. sounded like um, the speakers had blown and not like a shooting. I think that's why it took so many people so long to realize that this was a shooting and, and not just blown speakers. I heard the lady behind us say, um, look at all those people are running towards us. And I just, I won't forget the just like pure terror and you see just like a stampede of people coming at you. So when we first went towards Mandalay Bay, um, I realized there's no exit. And then we turn around, we go, back the other way and I realized there's no exit. I grabbed my friend and as I'm grabbing my friend, I felt like the bullets starting again because they were hitting the tree and bouncing off the ground and I'm waiting to feel a bullet hit, hit us. I don't think the fear really set in until we were back in the hotel room. I'm, I'm glad that I had my friends there with me because it made it a lot easier to 
to focus on other things and not focus on what just happened and the horror of everything. At least 58 people now dead, more than 500 people wounded in a horrific shooting on the Las Vegas Strip. It's the deadliest mass shooting in modern United States history. We begin with California burning tonight. States of emergency as the fires now turn deadly. We're watching fires north of San Francisco tonight. So the Tubbs fire started um, just north of downtown Calistoga in Napa County. So it started in another county in the state responsibility area. And it grew very quickly. The first Cal Fire Battalion chief that arrived on scene immediately gave evacuation orders and resource requests. Wind drives fire. I mean, there's you know there's two things that drive you know a wildland incident are wind and slope. And um, when you get a wind you know of that magnitude coming in and humidity is low, temperatures are elevated, um, it can drive fire and have a, sig a substantial effect on fire behavior. The wind was howling through there. Fuck. You can see the flames are probably 100 feet high, um, trees exploding, the wind's blowing embers sideways, um, so you got no time. I knew there were residences up there, so I immediately started going up and uh, trying to make notifications. Shots up this! Next house. How much time do I got? None. You need to get out now. Where are you at? Right Come on. Screw your shoe. Come on. Oh, she's disabled. All right, all right, let me get her feet. Let me get her feet. Her husband's right behind you. Sheriff, one stand for We're doing a carry out. Ready? Watch your leg. Watch your leg. Sir, you got to go. Get your car. Driving down roads that were there, you, to go in to make a notification, you come out and the road's on fire, the, the fire is on both sides of the streets. When you'd get out of the car, we are getting pelted with, it felt like you were getting sandblasted, is what it felt like. And it was little embers that were just blowing in the wind. I don't know how we as deputies didn't catch fire. I'm not wearing fire retardant clothing. Um, I know I was getting pelted with it. I know what my car looked like afterwards. And I know that we were walking around in the same stuff our vehicles were driving in. The fire was starting to um, kind of swirl around on us. And that was about the first time that I started actually worrying about the fire coming behind us and trapping us on these roads. As every, every few minutes passed by, the situation got worse and worse and worse. We're in the early morning hours of the night, so the fire's been burning four to six hours now, and the fire has burned right into the heart of Santa Rosa. It's taken out all the hillside just east of us, um, tons of homes. I, I know just mentally the area that's burning, I can picture in my head, and I'm realizing that it is enormously populated, and, and, and where it came from, I know it's just destroyed a huge chunk of the county. It was this sort of fog of war came over where it was like, What's going on? Is this really happening? Is this a bad dream? Um, but, you know, obviously it wasn't, and we just continue to focus on the mission, getting ahead of it, doing what we could to save lives, and, but it was really just, it was sort of awe-inspiring. Then it crosses the freeway and goes into what's called Coffee Park. Coffee Park is a very dense um, housing track in the heart of Santa Rosa. Businesses, housing, uh, Kmart shopping center, burned Kmart, burned the shopping center, burned all the houses in Coffee Park. It burned the heart of Santa Rosa. If you would have asked me if a fire could burn there from a wildfire, I would have told you never. It's never coming there. It blazed through all of it. I didn't know fire could do that. Mutual aid in this case is imperative, uh, both from the fire and law enforcement side. Um, we started requesting resources very, very early on. Alameda SO, our mutual aid regional coordinator, had 150 cars here in the morning. San Francisco Police Department, 100 cars in the front lot by 8 o'clock. I started seeing cops coming from San Francisco. I started seeing firemen coming from Central California. Uh, it was amazing, absolutely amazing. We ran 300 law enforcement officers per shift for three weeks with mutual aid. That's how big of an operation we ran. 
and with 102 different law enforcement agencies. The base camp that was set up at our fairgrounds uh, turned out to be the biggest base camp in California history to date with the number of people that were there and the number of resources that were there. We evacuated over 100,000 people throughout this event. We put 4,900 people in 24 different shelters, evacuation shelters. The people that come to shelters are the most vulnerable uh, parts of our population. Uh, we had people coming from everything from uh, skilled nursing homes and um, an elderly population, uh, uh, residential care facilities that uh, really couldn't care for themselves. And if it wasn't for some very heroic efforts of the first responders who helped them evacuate from those facilities, um, I think a lot of people would, would not be with us today. We had 6,200 structures and 5,200 homes burned in this county alone, and this fire impacted like four counties. Our fear that night was that we had thousands dead. Unfortunately, we lost 24 people. Uh, it's terrible to lose a life. 24 people is too many to lose in a fire like this. Training in this job truly is everything. Um, you can't plan for the incidents that we deal with. Um, things happen that you can't control. But what you can train for is how to deal with all kinds of incidents. What's also really important about training is that we always train and interact with each other. So the more we can go to outside training, events like Urban Shield, where they work together and they learn how to do major events together, not only you build relationships, you learn how to adapt to people you don't normally work with when you have to do those things. In times of stress and great peril, you don't rise to the level of your expectations, you fall to the level of your training. If you, if you train poorly, you're gonna behave, you're gonna react poorly. If you train properly, you're gonna react properly. Even if you're exhausted, because it's automatic. Urban Shield is a fantastic tool to teach anybody, whether you're in law enforcement or fire or EMS or um, any service that's gonna be involved in a critical incident. It's great because it pushes you to the max. We abide by a rule we call the training in the red zone. We want people to be stressed, stress inoculated. We want to see the responders uh, really perform in very highly stressful but realistic environments so we know that in the real world those same environments are going to be comparable so hopefully they'll be better able to perform their duties. What I was able to use was the ability to calm myself down, to be able to say I've been through I've been through hell. I've, I've done Urban Shield three times previously as a competitor. I've been up for those hours. I've been able to rationalize through scenarios that are irrational um, for what most of us believe we will ever experience. So it's the same thing. It honestly was the same thing. There's no combined training in the world that will give you that exposure with that many different types of stressful, traumatic, interactions, it's a fantastic training tool. And I thought of all the different things that I learned when I was in Urban Shield. I don't think that I would have, I would be here uninjured if it weren't for Urban Shield. I don't think that my friends would be here uninjured. So I'm, I'm glad that I was able to experience it because I can't imagine what it would have been like if I didn't experience Urban Shield. In the 12 months since our last Urban Shield training event, we've been reminded of the importance of training our emergency first responders and why working together in times of crisis is more important now than ever before. We have witnessed several horrific mass shootings that include a Las Vegas massacre that killed 59, the Parkland High School shooting in Florida where 17 victims were gunned down, 27 people killed at the Sutherland Church shooting in Texas and closer to our own home, the shootings near Rancho Tehama Elementary School in Corning, a veteran's home in Yountville, and the YouTube headquarters shooting in San Bruno. Our state has also experienced huge firestorms in Santa Rosa, Napa, Ventura, Redding, and Lake County, where some of the most destructive and devastating natural disasters in California history. All of these events have occurred since last year's Urban Shield, some of the worst, most horrific, and tragic events in modern history, all in just a single year. So it goes without saying that training and being prepared for events like these is more important now than it ever has been. In the past 12 years, Urban Shields evolved into the finest multidiscipline, multifaceted training event covering all aspects of emergency response. 
It includes the collaboration between first responders, the disciplines such as law, fire, EMS, medical, community emergency response teams, emergency management, as well as our public and private sectors, along with our community preparedness element. There are over 6,000 individuals participating in Urban Shield who will become force multipliers when a major incident occurs. And because of our training, they are now more prepared for disasters, both natural and man-made. I'd like to thank each and every one of you and all of you who have participated in Urban Shield and supported our Urban Shield program. Your dedication and passion has made our community stronger, safer, and more resilient, and what we believe, better prepared. You are the true heroes, so for that, I thank you. Keep up the great work and be safe.